Hello and welcome to What's In It For Africa, where it's our job to inform you about EU policy shaping the political and business relationships between Europe and Africa. Now, in this month's episode, we're going to be talking about the EU's move towards new transparency rules on conflict minerals. And to help us to do so, we're going to be speaking to Member of the European Parliament, Yulul Winkler, who is leading parliamentary discussions on the file. He's also the Vice Chair of the International Trade Committee and a member of the European People's Party. We will also be talking to Frédéric Triest, the Deputy Executive Secretary at the European Network for Central Africa, an organisation working to advocate for peace and development in the region. So, before we go inside the issue, let's get a rundown of what's been going on in Brussels over the summer. It's time for the EU updates. So, the European Union wants your input, specifically in relation to a public consultation on EU law compliance checks. Now, this consultation relates to energy purchasing agreements with non-EU countries. Now, the Commission specifically wants to look into its current information exchange mechanism. This means that it looks at information from each contracting party and assesses whether their agreements comply with EU law. Now, as you can imagine, this isn't particularly effective because it only identifies the issue of non-compliance with EU law, but doesn't really address the issue. So this is why the consultation will be focusing specifically on looking how they can comply with the law during the negotiation process. In order to do so, the consultation suggests an obligatory control by the EU before signatures. Now, this consultation is very interesting for African countries, since Sub-Saharan Africa actually remains the least explored area for oil and for gas. However, recent discoveries, particularly in East Africa, have found up to 5 trillion cubic metres of natural gas. Not to mention, the International Energy Agency has also said that Sub-Saharan African countries could outstrip Russia as the global gas supplier by 2040. So, as Europe potentially looks to Sub-Saharan African countries for energy supplies, this particular consultation is very crucial. African industry and countries should be aware that EU law compliance checks will play a more active role in these energy purchasing agreements going forward. But don't fret, there's still time to put pen to paper because the public consultation ends on the 22nd of October. So they say as one door closes, another one opens, but we're going to be doing it a bit in the reverse today since the public consultation that we're talking about has actually closed over the summer. And it's in relation to the EU Action Plan on Forest Law Governance, Enforcement and Trade, otherwise known as FLEGT. Now, under this EU Action Plan and under specifically the consultation, the Commission wants to look into the voluntary partnership agreements. Now, these agreements seek to ensure that illegal logging is reduced by making sure that all of the imports from timber producing countries come from legal sources. So why is this interesting for Africa? Well, 42% of Cameroon, for example, is covered by dense rainforests and it's a leading timber producing country in the region. Also, it's in the process of implementing these voluntary partnership agreements, along with the Central African Republic, Ghana, Liberia and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Now the next step after the recommendations come in from this public consultation is that they will be used in order to feed into the next action plan. Although we don't know what this will be yet, we'll be sure to keep you informed. It's September and so the EU is going to be starting to discuss intensely its new transparency rules on conflict minerals and the three institutions are divided. Now the European Commission early last year proposed legislation on conflict minerals that would see EU importers only under a voluntary obligation to self-certify to ensure that minerals and metals were not coming from conflict affected areas. Now the minerals and metals that are covered in this piece of legislation include gold and what we know is the three T's, 
tin, tantalum and tungsten. These three metals are used in everyday consumer electronic goods. However, the European Parliament does not agree. It sees that the best way forward is to ensure a mandatory approach to self-certification and also compliance with the rules, not only for EU importers, but also for smelters and refiners. Also, this piece of legislation covers conflict affected areas and high risk areas. For instance, the Democratic Republic of Congo is a good example, as well as those countries in the Great Lakes region. So, what's next? Well, the intense debate will continue over the next few months in order to come to a common approach between the three institutions of the European Union. Until then, what we will be doing is sitting down and speaking to the experts in the know and getting to grips with the pros and cons of the current rules. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for it's, inviting me. It's really a pleasure. Um, so as the rapporteur, could you um, give our viewers a kind of a brief overview of uh, the regulation and what are the most interesting aspects do you think for people in Africa, um, either producers um, or people working within this industry? The dossier of the conflict minerals, I will uh, simply put it like this because it has a very complicated and long name, but the dossier of conflict minerals basically uh, has the objective of uh, stopping a very bad phenomenon for, uh, for the, the African continent, uh, which is the fact that uh, militias and uh, factions and, and, and uh, illegal groupings are financing their activity from the extraction and the commerce with, uh, with uh, minerals in, uh, on the African continent. Uh, we have started the debate of the concrete proposal of the Commission and it was a very heated debate, basically on several, uh, on several topics. First of all, uh, what can you do here in Europe to uh, have an influence on a situation which is in Africa? Then, uh, how should you uh, uh, have an interaction with also the governments in African states, uh, also the civil society and the, all the stakeholders in the African society, but also with the companies in Europe, because of course uh, uh, companies and uh, economic stakeholders bear a big responsibility. One thing I would like to emphasize, and it seems to me that it's the most important thing, that the European Union tries to build up uh, uh, a coordinated response to the uh, problem of the conflict minerals, meaning that not only this regulation on transparency, but also we have uh, diplomatic action in African state, uh, states and uh, uh, we uh, are already earmarked more money to finance the dialogue uh, and uh, the cooperation also with civil society, uh, also with uh, the uh, stakeholders, the economic stakeholders in African states, but also with the governments of, of various African states, because uh, it's not possible that you solve a problem in the Great Lakes region yeah. from here, yeah. from Brussels. You have to cooperate, and I think that uh, the cooperation has to be between equal partners. And uh, just picking on the compulsory uh, aspect um, of the proposed regulation or the possibility of it being compulsory, do you think there's more strength in it being a, a compulsory um, piece of legislation? Um, and also, where do you see it fitting in compared to, for instance, the Dodd-Frank Act, which now we have some experience of how it's implemented and the effects that it has on the industry um, on the ground. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? We had, uh, we had a great deal of debates and I have consulted many, many sources about what is really happening, for example, what the effects of the Dodd-Frank Act were. And uh, uh, unfortunately, we had very contradictory signals here in the European Parliament because we have received opinions and studies saying that the effects of the compulsory Dodd-Frank Act were positive. So the, the, the link between the illegal activities and the uh, mining and economic activity in the Great Lakes region has decreased. But also we have been receiving negative reports telling that the Dodd-Frank Act had an embargo effect. So it is so costly and so complicated for the companies that they simply prefer not to source anymore from the Great Lakes region, but to uh, try to find alternative sources uh, for their uh, needs of materials, minerals and so on. So it is a little bit contradictory for the moment. Of course, the Dodd-Frank Act is a relatively recent regulation. It's very difficult in economy, in economic processes, 
to uh, to find the the, the, the uh, uh, concrete and objective results after just a few years. It is still a process which is ongoing. My personal opinion uh, uh, is that, uh, as a rapporteur, but uh, as a as a politician in the European Parliament, my personal opinion is that for the first step it would be. Uh, 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 preferable to have a voluntary approach to build uh, the knowledge necessary to apply these due diligence processes, to build up the institutions, because we have to create some institutions in the European Union uh, and we have to create a framework. Also, we have to create uh, the capacities and capabilities in the African countries, uh, or at least to assist the creation of uh, new mentalities. Uh, I think that, uh, that uh, industry is not necessarily bad and the civil society is not necessarily good. And can I ask you, in your discussions with many stakeholders, I'm sure, um, what have you been hearing from some of those that are representing the African interest, either business or government? What have been their views or input into how they see the European Union framing this, uh, this regulation? Do you have any insights? What I can tell you is that I found uh, contradictory views also between the African stakeholders. So I think that uh, this is a good sign that uh, this controversy is not only a Brussels European Parliament controversy, but it is also a controversy in uh, uh, the Great Lakes uh, countries' uh, internal societies. So I think that there are players who view things differently. It's very important to, to continue the dialogue and to try to arrive to some consensus. Now, um, I'd like to first understand what are your primary concerns about the discussions that are going on at the moment. Yes, so uh, we are now at a stage where the, the Council, the Member States, have to adopt a common position. So our main concern is that the, these Member States support, uh, for, for support a stronger, a more ambitious legi legislation than the initial proposal of the Commission. Why? Because the Commission proposed in March of last year a voluntary system uh, so voluntary requirements for um, a limited number of companies, of importers, so they disclose how they source, basically. And what we would like to see at the end is mandatory requirements covering not only the importers of raw material, but also covering other, what we call the semi-finished and finished products containing the so-called conflict minerals. What is your view about the actions taken from the governments in the Great Lakes region, but also the political organisation, which is the International Conference on the Great Lakes region, um, in terms of uh, regional certification, but also some of the whistleblowing measures that, that have been put in place? Mm -hmm. well, I think it's, uh, there are really important uh, initiatives. Um, I would say that uh, it's in, uh, way to, to, to start, but it's not enough. The member, the, the states in the region should do more to better regulate uh, the artisanal exploitation and the trade in artisanal minerals. Um, basically, Rwanda and DRC adopted legislation on due diligence already. The ICGLR mechanism um, on certification is very important because it allows, it's a clean production to access market, and that's also what, what people want, the, the creuser, the, the, the miners, they want to have a better access to a better price, basically. So uh, the, um, I would insist on this importance of efforts of governments first to, to regulate the sector. It means basically for DRC, they are already engaged in qualifying mining sites, meaning that if a green uh, a mining site is declared green, there is no child wo uh, work on the site, there is no prostitution, no weapons and, and so on. Then um, the, this production is traced um, until the export, the, the point of export, and they, they get uh, uh, certificates from the region saying that this, this is a clean production and it builds trust for business. This has already started, but it's not. It's more an island for the moment in Eastern DRC. When you look about maybe 2,000 mining sites um, potentially active in Eastern DRC, you only have a bit more than 150 mining sites qualified as green for the moment. But I mean, if you compare the situation for a year ago, it's already really an important uh, progress. So it has to be increased, and uh, but it's basically positive. Um, what do you think that the EU can learn from um, the impact of the Dodd-Frank Act for a lot of the, 
the regions that are affected by conflict minerals. Um, we've heard discussions about you know Congolese mining sites having to be shut um, due to the fact that they're trying to keep up with the legislation and mm. and how. So, what do you think we can can be learning from this? Mm. First of all, uh, I think the EU has already learned from the Dutch franc experience because there is a big difference between the proposal of the Commission and the Dodd Frank Act. Mm -hmm. Because the Dodd Frank Act is only focused on minerals produced in Central Africa, while the EU uh, proposal um, is, has a, a broad geographical scope. It can be any region, high risk region or conflict affected region in, in all, on all the, the continents. So I think it, it was really important for us um, in our advocacy uh, to avoid that business just simplify their, their, their choice by saying we do not source from Central Africa anymore and we are done, we have no, no more efforts to do. So that we want to avoid, but also we are conscious that um, a legislation like Dodd Frank itself will not solve the conflict. Never pretended that. Um, so it's a contribution to, to put more responsibility on, on, on business, mm -hmm. but um, a lesson to be learned from Dodd Frank is that it ha a legislation has to come with accompanying measures to help the countries, uh, to diff actors at different level, the government in Kinshasa, but also the local authorities that are supposed to regulate uh, artisanal activity, the creuser themselves, the miners, miners the cooperatives, um, so that they, they, they understand what, the, what are the standards and help them to comply so that they can um, reconnect to the market when the production is clean, they should access a fair price for their job. No, it's it's what, what basically what we want. So basically, a, a lesson to be learned is to develop accompanying measures and the EU has already underst uh, understand that because they announced um, 20 million the uh, next five years dedicated to the accompanying measures. Um, so I think it's, it's important uh, and of course speaking about a region in conflict like Eastern DRC, the EU has to continue to invest in uh, a security issue, uh, reform of the, of the Congolese army, uh, um, the, the um, uh, work on the mandate of the MONUSCO by example, there is a wide range of, of uh, measures that can uh, help the regulation to be more efficient on the ground. Thank you. So that's it for this episode. Thank you for watching What's In It For Africa. Subscribe on YouTube, follow us on Twitter and we'll be back next month.